Call your next witness. Yes, the defense will call Mr. Mark Garrigus. Come forward, please. When you get to the witness stand, remain standing. Face the clerk and raise your right hand. Yes. Please be seated. Thank you. State and spell your name for the record. Mark Garagos. G-E-R-A-G-O-S. Thank you. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Tom. Would you please give a little summary of your education? I went to college, I went to law school, I passed the bar. Okay, laughter. That was kind of long-winded, wasn't it? It was not a very distinguished undergraduate or graduate career, so. And you were a lawyer in Los Angeles, correct? I am. I've got a firm in Los Angeles, which I share with my father and my brother, named Garagus and Garagus. We stayed up all night thinking it up. All right. Do you know the fellow seated at council table to my right? Yes. And who is he? Michael Jackson, who was a client of mine for about 16 months. And when did you first meet Mr. Jackson? It would have been probably about February, the first week of February of 2003, I believe. And at some point, you were retained to represent Mr. Jackson, right? That's correct. And how did that come about? Although I know you've told me out of court that there is a waiver, Your Honor, I have not seen nor heard it on the record, and I'm more comfortable if I have that first. Certainly. I can represent to the court there is a waiver of the attorney-client privilege so Mr. Garrigus can testify. You have a written waiver you'll provide him with after court today? We will do that, Your Honor, sure. Is that satisfactory? That is, Your Honor. Thank you. When were you first retained to represent Mr. Jackson? It would have been sometime shortly before I met him the first time. The first time I met Michael was at Neverland, and I was contacted by somebody from, I think, Paul Hastings. And then was sent, or there was a series of transactions, I guess, or faxes back and forth, and ultimately I was retained and then went up to Neverland and met Michael for the first time. And why were you retained? At that point, there were allegations that were being made in the media and there was also, as I remember, complaints that were being made to child services about him, his fitness as a parent, as well. And did you represent Mr. Jackson in those two areas? I did. I was given the role, so to speak, among a cast of thousands, to kind of coordinate and be a person who would look out for his interests in those areas. And when you began to represent Mr. Jackson, were you reporting to anyone in particular? Well, when I first came on board, there was a gentleman, who I saw in the hallway just a minute ago, David Legrand, who was there, who was a lawyer who was coordinating a lot of the stuff. There was a gentleman who he introduced me to named Ronald Conitzer. And there was a gentleman over at Paul Hastings. And I feel awful, I can't remember his name, because he's the person who referred me over there in the first place. But there was another lawyer there. But generally what would happen is, it wasn't so much reporting as we would have these interminably long conference calls. And generally who was involved in those calls? It seemed like everyone. There were all kinds of people on the conference calls. There were PR people. Paul Hastings lawyers. David Legrand would be on the conference call. I would plug into the conference call. Ronald Conitzer would be on the conference call, among others. Those are the ones that come to mind. And were these conference calls occurring on a daily basis? It seemed like it. Typically who would initiate the conference call? I think David's office would be my, would, but that would be a guess. I really don't know. Was Michael Jackson usually involved in these conference calls? Usually not. Was he involved in any of them? He, there were a couple of calls. You're talking about February of, 03. Sure. There were a couple of calls where Michael would get on the phone for brief periods of time, but generally were not the same as what I'm talking about with these conference calls. Those would be a call where maybe Ronald would put him on the phone, there would a brief discussion. It wouldn't be more than, I don't know, 45 seconds or a minute, usually, it seemed like. It was very quick. And I believe said your work involved response to the Bashir documentary? Well, the lawyers who were responding to the Bashir documentary, as I understood it, was there was, I think it was Paul Hastings' English barristers who were dealing with the documentary there and dealing with some issue that they kept talking about some board that was involved that they were making complaints about. 
And then here, my role was to see if there was any kind of anything that needed to be done to protect him in terms of his parental rights or anything else from the accusations that were being made against him. Was your firm exclusively involved in the area of child custody, parental rights? No, there was. He had a, I don't know if he still has, but there was a lawyer by the name of, I think his name was Lance Spiegel, from a firm on the west side of Los Angeles, and he was clearly primarily with the custody issues. My role was if there was any DCFS involvement, if there was anybody who was trying to do anything else. Basically to see if there was anything else that he needed protection against. Was a potential DCFS investigation the only investigation you were concerned about at the time? No, no, I was concerned about, obviously at the same time that the documentary came out, at the time, there were people making all kinds of accusations about Michael, and specifically with one young man who was involved in that documentary, and I was supposed to look into that as well. And was his name, Gavin Arvizo? Yes. Okay, at some point, did you ever hear the name, Janet Arvizo? At the very, probably before I heard the name, Gavin. And how did you hear her name? Initially there was a rundown of exactly what the situation was. And I couldn't tell you exactly if it was Paul Hastings or if it was the English counterpart or the American counterpart or if it was David, but there was a rundown of the situation. I was told about the Arvizos. I was also told in the first thing that was done that had any urgency is there was a 60 minutes taping that was scheduled, and they wanted me to be up there to make sure that Michael didn't make any statements or questions weren't asked that were inappropriate. And was this at Neverland? Yes. Did you see Janet Arvizo at Neverland on that day? I remember seeing Gavin at Neverland that day. And then we were there for, I don't know, maybe 12 hours or so. And during that time there, I was getting downloaded with information as well from a number of people at the ranch itself. And what was your role as far as your representation of Mr. Jackson went on that occasion? Well, that was really, they just wanted me, I guess, as a backstop on the interview. And ultimately, after sitting there for about 12 hours, it was my decision, or I told them that, look, if I was going to be involved, I didn't want him doing the interview, and I pulled the plug on it. So ultimately that interview with 60 Minutes did not take place, correct? On that occasion in February of 2003, it did not. I, I said that it was not going to happen, and asked that they, politely asked Mr. Bradley, and there was another producer, whose name I think was Radotsky, Michael Radotsky, who was there told them that this was not going to happen. And you say you were at Neverland approximately 12 hours that day? It seemed like it, yeah. And did you see Ms. Janet Arvizo there the whole time? Well, portions, is my memory. I remember, I have vivid memories about Gavin Arvizo talking with Ed Bradley and Gavin Arvizo talking with Radotsky, which I think is his name, the producer, and then seeing what was going on there. And also hearing these stories that people were telling me, and trying to just take it in and sort out whatever it was. And was it your understanding that the Arvizos wanted to have a role in that 60 Minutes documentary? I watched as. I'm going to object as to speculative. Sustained. Referring only to your state of mind at the time, Mr. Garrigus, did you have any knowledge one way or the other whether or not the Arvizos were supposed to be involved in the documentary? I object as irrelevant to this question. You have to let him finish the question so I know what you're objecting to. Mr. Garrigus, just directing my question to your state of mind at the time, did you have any understanding one way or the other whether or not Janet Arvizo and the children were supposed to appear in a 60 Minutes documentary? Objection to his state of mind as being irrelevant to this proceeding. Sustained. In your capacity as Mr. Jackson's attorney on that day, did you have any understanding as to why the Arvizos were at Neverland? The, I saw an interaction between Gavin Arvizo. I'm going to object to any vision of interaction as being irrelevant to this proceeding, and the question is irrelevant and lacking in foundation. He's cutting off the witness, Your Honor, I object. I think that question can be answered, yes, or, no, and we can go from there. Do you want the question read back? God, I hate to say, no. Did I see, did I see an interaction? Yes. I'll have the question read back so you understand it. In your capacity as Mr. Jackson's attorney on that day, did you have any understanding as to why the Arvizos were at Neverland? Yes. What was your understanding? Objection. Lack of foundation. Sustained. As Mr. Jackson's attorney, 
were you under any instructions to do anything with the Arvizos at Neverland on that particular day? Objection. Vague. Instruction from whom? Sustained. Did you talk to Janet Arvizo that day? Briefly, I believe, but, I know that I didn't talk to her. I watched her interact or converse with Mr. Radotsky, who was the producer. I believe Mr. Bradley. Did you see Ms. Arvizo talking to Mr. Radotsky for any length of time that day? I don't know if I would say a length of time. I saw at least on two occasions, I think. And why were you at Neverland that day? I was asked to come up by Mr. Legrand specifically to, I guess, monitor the interview. And were you under the impression, as you arrived, that the Arvizos were going to be there? Yes. Why? It's what I was told. Is that by Mr. Legrand? I believe it was. And were you told why they were going to be there? I believe Mr. Legrand told me that. That would be, yes, or, no, your honor. I object to any answer beyond that. Sustained. Yes, or, no. Yes. And what was your understanding as to why they were going to be there? Objection. Hearsay. Lack of foundation. Sustained. Did you give any advice to the Arvizos on that particular day? No. Did you talk to Gavin Arvizo on that particular day? No. Who else do you recall being at Neverland on that particular day, other than the people you've identified? Dieter Weisner was there. I think a gentleman by the name of Jack Sussman from CBS was there. There was a woman which, also with CBS with the last name of Simon, I think was there. There was another lawyer from my office with me. I can't remember which lawyer it was. And there was a, I don't know, a cast of probably 30 or 40 people, production people, who were there as well. And what time did you arrive there that day? I couldn't tell you. It was light outside. But I don't, I would imagine late morning, early afternoon, but that's just a guess. What time do you think you left? Whatever, 8, 10, 12 hours after I arrived. When you left, do you know whether or not Janet Arvizo was still there? I do not. Do you know whether or not Gavin Arvizo was still there? I do not, not as I sit here today. Did you hear Janet Arvizo say anything to Mr. Radotsky? Not that I can remember as I sit here. Did you see Janet Arvizo talk to Ed Bradley of 60 Minutes? I believe that I did. Did you hear what she said? Not that I can remember. Okay. Did you see either Mr. Bradley or Mr. Radotsky talking to Gavin Arvizo? Yes. I think Radotsky, with Mr. Bradley. I don't know that he was actively participating, but I do believe Radotsky was talking. And approximately what date was this, Mr. Garrigus? I want to say February 7th, and I just, I don't know if that was a Saturday. I don't believe it was a court day. So it was either a Saturday or a Sunday, but I'd just be guessing again. Have you seen the Bashir documentary at this point? I have seen it, but not recently. No, had you seen it at this particular point in time? No, I had not. Did you ever see Janet Arvizo again? No, I don't believe that I have. Have you ever spoken to her on the phone? No, I don't believe that I have. Okay. Following that visit to Neverland, you continue to represent Mr. Jackson, right? That's correct. And what were the things you were doing as a lawyer for Mr. Jackson? Well, one of the first things that I did after that was to get a hold of the, a copy of the documentary by Mr. Bashir. I watched it. We were, on these conference calls, they would talk about what the various allegations were against Michael. One of the first things I did is involve a private investigator. And I involved a private investigator and I had some associates in the firm do some database searching on various players involved. Now, was it your understanding at that point that Mr. Snedden had started any investigation? No, it was not my understanding that he had. Had you heard of any statements Mr. Snedden had made anywhere about an investigation into Michael Jackson at that point? In early February, no. The only thing that, as I remember, in early February, that sticks out in my mind now as I sit here, was something about somebody complaining to DCFS. Now, you said you started your own investigation, right? That's correct. And why did you do that? I was. The things that I was hearing about the Arvizos gave me great pause. What were you hearing? I'll object as hearsay and irrelevance and lack of foundation and vague as to time. 
I'm going to overrule the objection and I'm going to allow the witness to answer, but I'll caution the jury that at this point, what he states that he heard about the family is not offered for the truth of the matter asserted, but it's offered to explain why he did certain things thereafter. Go ahead. Thank you. I had, when I was up there, sitting up there that day, somebody had told me a story about Gavin being told to refer to Michael as daddy, and that, that Michael was uncomfortable with that. That the person that was telling me was probably one of the people who were, it was either Weisner or Konitzer or somebody, somebody who was up there, and that that concerned him greatly. That obviously gave me pause, and so in response to that, I decided to run some database searches on the Arvizos. Did you run those database searches on the Arvizos? I did. And what did you find? The, a lawsuit against J.C. Penney's and, a lawsuit against J.C. Penney's and then a purported, and then I had somebody, and I don't know if it was in office or not, take a look at the file or do a little bit more due diligence on it. That was look at the J.C. Penney file? Correct. Okay, and why did you do that? Well, I had a concern at that point that given what was going on, that somebody might use the situation to manipulate my client. And when you say, manipulate, your client, what do you mean? It was not unknown to me that my client is frequently the target of litigation, so I, and you've got a whirlwind of activity going around and you've got people making accusations. It occurs to me that I want to know if some of the players that are involved have a litigious history, so that's why I ran the database search. Now, did you do the database search yourself or did you have an investigator do it? That's what I said before. I don't know if it was in-house or out. I can't tell you, as I sit here, for sure, whether I had Brad do it, whether I had somebody just run it on either Lexis or Westlaw in the office, but somebody did it and came up with it. Who is Brad? Brad Miller is the investigator who I hired to start to do an investigation on the Arvizos. And approximately when did you start your investigation into the Arvizos? It would have been very shortly after leaving Neverland. So if that was the 7th or the 8th, it would have been within a couple of days. And when do you think you learned about the J.C. Penney lawsuit that had been filed by the Arvizos? Within a couple of days. Okay, and what was your reaction to what you learned about that suit? I was gravely concerned. Why? I thought that given the situation, and I was also given information that they were attempting or that there were rumors that the family was attempting. I'm going to object to any reference to rumors or any information from an unnamed source as lacking in foundation, speculative. Sustained. Was the investigation you did into the J.C. Penney lawsuit the first part of your investigation into the Arvizos? Probably. I mean, to that extent that you run some kind of a database search, I suppose that was. If it wasn't the first, it was in the top five. And was Mr. Miller involved in that search into the J.C. Penney lawsuit, to your knowledge? I would imagine that after I, if he didn't find it, that I quickly brought it to his attention and he did do, he probably would have. He probably would have been the guy that I assigned to follow up on it. But I, I don't know as I sit here. Is Mr. Miller a licensed private investigator in California? He is. And had you worked with him before? I had, on, I think, probably three or four occasions. Okay, and where was his office at the time? You know, I believe at the time it was in Beverly Hills. But I can't, that's only because I know it was in Beverly Hills at one time and it's no longer in Beverly Hills. I don't know in February of, 03 if it still was in Beverly Hills. I couldn't tell you. Did the investigation into the Arvizos that you started continue? Yes. I had him, or I asked him to please find out where they were, and to document what they were doing, who they were meeting with, and whether or not they were either trying to sell a story to the tabloids, or meeting with lawyers, or anything even more grave than that at least from my client's standpoint. When you say, more grave than that, what are you talking about? Well, I, I thought at that time that it was a problem that somebody could manipulate the situation. I don't know, I don't want to run through a parade of horribles in my mind, but I thought that, given what the situation was, somebody could take advantage of it, and I was worried about that. And I, so I decided I wanted to know, and I told Brad, tell me where they are, tell me what they're doing, and tell me who they're meeting with. Were you concerned that the Arvizos might be planning to extort Michael Jackson? Objection. Leading. Sustained. I was. I was concerned. There's an objection. Just a moment. I'm sorry. Next question.
What else did you do to investigate the problem of the Arvizos possibly manipulating Michael Jackson? Well, I, besides have Brad do that, we investigate. They were not the only, they weren't the sole focus, but for your, to answer your question, I also told Brad I wanted him to go and take a statement and get a statement from them. And why did you want Brad Miller to get a statement from the Arvizos? Because I found that, in the past, at least, with other cases, that if somebody gives a statement right at the time, that it's much more difficult later for them to make up something and change the story, because you're locked into it. That's what the truth was, and that's why I wanted a statement. And in your experience, it's pretty typical for an investigator to try and get statements, correct? Objection. Leading. Overruled. You may answer. It's what investigators do. The reason you have the investigator take the statement and not the lawyer is so that the lawyer doesn't end up being like I am up here, on the witness stand. And to your knowledge, did Mr. Miller take a statement from the Arvizos? Yes, Mr. Miller took a statement. I told him to identify himself. I told him to tell them that he was taking it from me, and I told him that I wanted him to ask questions. Okay, and did you ever actually see that statement? Later I saw a transcript of it, but I don't know that I saw. I think he downloaded it to me in essence saying, this is what they said, this is what they said, this is what they said, in a telephone call is probably what he did. Was it your understanding, Mr. Garrigus, that statement would be recorded? I wanted a tape-recorded statement of them, detailing all of, or as extensively as possible, and I wanted it done, I probably told Brad something to the effect, I want it done yesterday. I don't want to wait. Get it done. Did anything else go on in the investigation of the Arvizos? Well, at the same time that that was happening, the, there was a rebuttal video being made by a gentleman named Schaffel, who seemed to be running that end of things, and that rebuttal video involved the Arvizos as well. So at one point I instructed Brad, go watch when that gets made and sit there, and don't leave until you get a copy of that videotape. Because I want a copy of the videotape, I don't want it to disappear into the ether. To your knowledge, did he do that? I know that he went there. I don't know that we ever got a copy of the videotape. Is there anything else you had Mr. Miller do to investigate the Arvizos? I don't know. Off the top of my head, the things that I described is what I remember, as I sit here. Did you ever arrange to have the Arvizos put under surveillance? I told him at one point I wanted to know where they were, what they were doing, who they were meeting with, and to report back to me. And as far as you know, putting people under surveillance is part of an investigation, and it's perfectly lawful, correct? I have done it on more than one occasion. I know most lawyers do it with great frequency. I know DAs do it, and law enforcement does it. Okay, and do you know whether or not the Arvizos were actually put under surveillance at some point? I do now, and I did then. Okay, to your knowledge, was anyone working with Mr. Miller in your investigation of the Arvizos? I know now that they were. He may have told me that a gentleman by the same of Asaf did something for him on one occasion. I know now that he had somebody named Johnny working for him. And I didn't know that at the time. Okay, and how long did your investigation of the Arvizos last, if you know? If he started sometime after February 7th, it would have gone through probably the middle or end of March would be my guess. Okay, now, you mentioned someone named Schaffel. Did you meet Mark Schaffel at some point? No. Did you ever speak to him? I've spoken to him on the phone. How often do you think you've spoken to him on the phone? I couldn't tell you. Anytime that anything came up about this video that was being made, I was always told to talk to Schaffel. How many conversations do you think you had with Schaffel about the making of the video? It would just be a guess. I have no idea. Okay. I would say 5 to 10, probably. Maybe more. Now, was Schaffel typically involved in the conference calls you have described before? Actually, no. He was not typically involved in the conference calls. In fact, at one point, David Legrand and I had discussed excising Schaffel from the whole situation. I'm going to object to that portion as being non-responsive to the question and hearsay. Sustained. Motion to strike. Strike it after, actually, no. Did you and Mr. Legrand have any discussions about Mark Schaffel? Yes. How many do you think you had? At least three. Okay. Did you have more discussions with Konitzer than you did Schaffel? Clearly. Clearly. And why do you say that? Ronald Konitzer was, from my perception, 
the person who was kind of the backstop or the person who was running things. And did you meet with him personally? Yes. On how many occasions, do you think? Probably at least three. Okay. Did you ever talk to a guy named Dieter Weisner? During the time period of February and March of 03, only the time that I was at Neverland did I speak to Dieter, and it was for just a very brief period of time. Okay. I later, in terms of time, I later talked to Dieter maybe a year after that more extensively. But February and March, no, I had very little contact with Dieter. Now, as part of your investigation into the Arvizos, you described the statement that Mr. Miller obtained, his attendance at the rebuttal video, and you say you learned about some surveillance that went on. Is there anything else that was part of that investigation that you remember? Well, I remember a series of letters with a gentleman named Dickerman. And storage of Janet Arvizo's things in a storage unit. And I remember going back and forth with Mr. Dickerman as to where he wanted those items in the things that he was claiming. You mentioned Janet Arvizo's possessions being in a storage unit. How did that happen? I, I don't know, because I wasn't there. Everything I know was later related to me. If that's okay, I'll get into that. You don't have, there's no objection. Okay. It was later related to me by Brad that she was moving in with her boyfriend who was. I'm going to object as to hearsay. Non-responsive to the question. Okay. Sustained. Was that one sustained, your honor? Yes. Thank you. He gave you the opening line, but you were talking to counsel. I tried to prompt you, Mr. Zonin. He was prompting you. Go ahead. Did you have anything to do with the storage of Janet Arvizo's possessions? I told Brad at one point, if you're going to do this, film it, so that you don't later get accused of taking something. And did you have any understanding as to why Brad was going to store that material? I believe. I'll object as hearsay. Overruled. You may answer. I believe it was because he was trying to remain in the good graces to get whatever information he could as to what they were up to. I'm going to object as speculative, move to strike. I'll strike that. Was it your understanding that Janet wanted Brad to store her possessions? Objection. Leading and speculative. Sustained. Do you know why those possessions were stored? Objection. Lack of foundation. Foundation. Sustained. Did you ever at any point have any knowledge as to why those possessions were stored by Mr. Miller? I'll object beyond. Yes, or, no. Yes, I'm sorry, I may have jumped the gun. That's fine. Go ahead. Next question. Why were they stored? Objection. Lack of foundation. Hearsay. Foundation. Sustained. Do you know why they were stored? I believe they were stored. I'll object to anything beyond, yes, or, no. Yes. How did you obtain your knowledge of how they were stored? Talking with Mr. Miller. Did he tell you why they were stored? Yes. Did you give any instructions to him about storing that material? I told him when he did the move. I'm going to object as hearsay. Sustained. Were those possessions stored at your request? No. Were they stored because Mr. Miller wanted to store them? Objection. Lack of foundation. Hearsay. Sustained. Did you ever see those possessions at any time? No. Did you ever go to storage to see those possessions? No. Now, you had some correspondence with attorney Bill Dickerman about those possessions, right? Yes. And what can you tell us about that? That every time I'd get a letter it didn't seem to represent the phone conversation that we had. And did he start writing to you about wanting those possessions returned? Yes. And do you know approximately when that happened? I do not. It was sometime after, it was sometime after February. And you were still representing Michael Jackson at the time, correct? I represented Michael all the way through, I don't know, whatever, February to whenever, December, I guess. Now, at some point, did you try to return those possessions to Mr. Dickerman? Yes. And please explain what you did. I directed. When I first got the letter from Mr. Dickerman, I told somebody to fax it over to Brad, somebody in my office to fax it over to Brad. And at some point, then received another letter, and letters kept coming back and forth. And there would be phone calls. And I kept trying to get this stuff over there, suggesting that either they take over the storage unit, 
that they pay for the storage unit, that they do anything to get it out, so that we could get out of the situation. Did you say that it was at your direction that the move was videotaped? I believe I'm the one who told Brad, if you're going to do this, you better videotape the move. I believe that's what I told him. It was almost those exact words. And did he ever tell you that Janet wanted him to move that stuff? Yes. When did he tell you that Janet wanted him to move that stuff? I'm going to object as hearsay. Move to strike. Overruled. The question, though, now, is, when did she tell you, no? When did he tell you that Janet wanted him to move the stuff? Probably in the same conversation I said, if you're going to do it, you should videotape it. And to your knowledge, was that material ever returned to Mr. Dickerman? You know, I assume so. But I know that there was one instance where I got so fed up with what was going on, that I actually told. I'll object as non-responsive. Sustained. Do you know if that material was ever returned to Mr. Dickerman? I know at one time I directed that it just be dumped into his law office so that he would take it, and the building wouldn't accept it. That was done at your request? To return it? Yes. At all times I said, return the stuff. Okay. Do you know someone named Frank Tyson? I've met Frank Tyson. And when did you first meet him? Probably it would have been mid-February of 2003, would be a guess. Do you know approximately where you met him? No, I can't tell you where I met him. I think he came to my office once with another guy whose name I can't remember. But I, but I don't know if that was the first time I met him or not. Did you have much communication with Frank Tyson? I talked to Frank occasionally. Would he typically call you? Most always. I wasn't calling him. How many conversations do you think you had with him? Well, if he would call me, I might call him back. But I don't know how many conversations. I don't know that it was a time. I think he was in communication with Brad more than he was with me. Okay. Now, at some point did your investigation into the Arvizos terminate? Yeah, I would say probably, probably about five or six weeks after it started. And did you reach any conclusions about the Arvizos, based upon your investigation? Yeah, they, that Michael could have nothing to do with them. Why is that? I just felt like it was a pending disaster. And what do you mean by, pending disaster? I just was not comfortable with what I was finding out, what I was hearing. I just wasn't comfortable with that. What were you finding out? Well, I... Objection. Hearsay. Sustained. Were you ever concerned that the Arvizos were going to try to extort Michael Jackson? Objection. Leading. Sustained. Were the results of your investigation negative or positive when it came to the Arvizos? Negative. Objection. Vague. Sustained. What did you conclude? I concluded that they, that they should. Objection. Calls for a conclusion. You should have said, asked and answered. He's already discussed that. Move on. Okay. As Mr. Jackson's lawyer at that point in time, did you think it was in his interest to be involved with the Arvizos? I. Objection. Asked and answered. No, it wasn't. It is. Next question. Okay. Sustained. All right. Did you ever hear anything about the Arvizos taking a trip to Brazil? Your Honor, I'm going to object as to hearsay. And vague, hear anything about. Your microphone's off again, sir. Sustained. Did you ever learn whether or not the Arvizos were planning to take a trip to Brazil? I learned later that there were. I will object to anything beyond, yes, or, no, as non-responsive. Yes. What did you learn? Objection. Hearsay. Sustained. Did you have anything to do with any planned trip to Brazil involving the Arvizos? No. Did you ever learn if anyone did? I learned that someone. Objection beyond, yes, or, no. Yes. What did you learn? Objection. Hearsay. Sustained. Did you ever learn that the Arvizos were traveling to any federal buildings to obtain passports or visas for a trip to Brazil? Objection. Beyond the scope. Objection. Lack of foundation and leading. Sustained on leading. Sustained. Okay. During the time you represented Michael Jackson, did you ever do anything involving a potential trip to Brazil with the Arvizos? 
I didn't do anything involving a potential trip to Brazil with the Arvizos. Did you ever learn anything about such a trip? I did, yes. When did you learn that? Sometime after Michael was arrested. Okay, and at some point, did you ever have possession of passports of the Arvizos? Yes. And could you explain that? The passport? When I was going through all of the materials that we had in our office in order to itemize them for you, in turning over all the files, the passports were located in a locked file cabinet where we kept a lot of Michael's files. I then directed one of the lawyers in my office to file the passports with the court so that I did not give them to you, so that you wouldn't be in a position where you would have to testify as to them. And did you, in fact, turn them into this court? I directed one of the lawyers in my office to bring them to the court and file them with the court as a court's exhibit. Okay, is that the last you saw of them? Yes. Okay, were you involved in any business matters related to Mr. Jackson during the first three months of 2003? There probably were times when Mr. Konitzer would ask about certain projects. And then if it was something somebody in the office, one of the other lawyers, could deal with, I would refer him to one of the other lawyers. So, yes, I would say that there were some occasions. And what kind of projects are you referring to? My understanding of what Mr. Konitzer's relationship was with Mr. Jackson was that he was helping to promote, I don't know, technological applications of various things. And it was usually surrounding those kind of items and usually it was beyond our expertise. So usually I would tell him, refer him over to somebody else or to some other lawyer. But he would come and seek advice on those things. Was any of this business-related legal work done in your office? Some could have been. I mean, there could have been. I could have sent. Probably my brother Matthew would have done some work in connection with various things that they were asking about. Loan refinancing, things of that nature. There was also a marketing idea that they were doing or they wanted to pursue. And were you having discussions with Mr. Legrand about Mr. Jackson's business matters? Mr. Legrand would bring up those issues, but it was really, that was really Mr. Legrand's area of, I guess his purview, so to speak. That was really what his niche was. He's what's called a transactional lawyer who deals with corporate matters, and that was really his expertise. In the discussions you had with Konitzer and Weisner about Mr. Jackson's business affairs, do you recall Mr. Jackson ever participating? Objection. Lack of foundation. Assumes facts not in evidence as to those conversations. Overruled. You may answer. It was my understanding that there was, in fact, it was more than an understanding because I believe that my retainer initially was signed on a power of attorney that. I'll object as non-responsive to the question. Sustained. Did you have any discussions with Mr. Konitzer about Mr. Jackson's business affairs? To the extent that Mr. Konitzer represented to me that he was running the business affairs. Is that what he told you? Yes. Did you have any discussions with Mr. Weisner about Mr. Jackson's business affairs? Not in 2003, in February or March. Like I said, the only contact I really had with Dieter was that first time I saw him briefly, discussed it briefly but I didn't really have that much contact with him. I really talked mostly with Ronald. And when you were retained, you had a retainer agreement signed, correct? That's correct. And that's your normal practice as a lawyer, right? And the state bar rules generally encourage that, if not require anything that's going to involve a certain amount of money. And a retainer agreement basically sets out the terms and conditions under which you'll represent a client as a lawyer, right? Right. Who signed your retainer agreement? I believe that it was signed by Konitzer and Weisner on a power of attorney, which I also was provided, that was signed by Mr. Jackson. Okay, did you ever see Konitzer sign any other documents on behalf of Mr. Jackson while you were representing Mr. Jackson? Not that I can pinpoint. I mean, I, no, not that I can think of right now. And did the power of attorney that you saw appear to give Mr. Konitzer the ability to sign documents for Mr. Jackson? It did. My understanding of it was that it did. And do you recall at any point in time when that power of attorney was revoked? I'll object to lack of foundation. Overruled. You may answer. I believe the power of attorney was revoked about the time that David Legrand got fired. But that's just my memory as I'm sitting here. I don't have anything to pin that on. And I believe you said, Mr. Garrigus, that you were under the impression that Konitzer was trying to take over Mr. Jackson's business affairs? 
it was my perception of Mr. Konitzer that he was the one who was running the business affairs in terms of hands-on, and that Mr. Legrand was the lawyer that was doing the corporate transactional work. And based on your involvement in discussions about Mr. Jackson's business, did it appear to you that Mr. Jackson wasn't involved much at all? Objection. Leading. Sustained. Objection. Speculative as well. Leading. Sustained. Did you ever meet Mr. Legrand in Las Vegas? I met Mr. Legrand at Neverland. And I met Mr. Legrand at another, at Paul Hastings, I believe, downtown LA as I sit here, I don't remember Las Vegas. If you've got something to refresh my memory, maybe, but I don't recall that as I sit here. Now, obviously, having represented Mr. Jackson, you're aware of what the charges are in this case, right? I am. And you're aware that the prosecutors are claiming there was a conspiracy to commit various crimes on the Arvizos, right? Objection. Leading. Overruled. I am aware of that. Were you ever part of any conspiracy to abduct the Arvizo children? No. Were you part of any conspiracy to extort anything from the Arvizos? Absolutely not. Were you ever part of any conspiracy to commit any crime against the Arvizos? Absolutely not. I was trying to prevent a crime against my client. And what crime was that? I thought that they were going to shake him down. I have no further questions. Cross-examine? Mr. Garrigus, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Zonin. Now, you were retained to represent Mr. Jackson in the early part of February, is that correct? That's correct. Could that have been the latter part of January? I don't think so, but, I mean, if, I don't want to quibble with you for a couple of days. I've always thought it was, I've always thought it was February 4th and that I went to Neverland on the 7th. I don't know why, that just sticks in my head. Now, prior to your being retained, were you familiar or did you know about the documentary, Living with Michael Jackson? I don't, I don't know. At the time that you were retained, did you know about the documentary, Living with Michael Jackson? At the time that the retainer agreement was signed, yes. At the time that you were first contacted by somebody. I was going to say. From Michael Jackson's organization about your representing Mr. Jackson, did you know about the documentary, Living with Michael Jackson? Probably not. Who was the first person to call you about your representing Mr. Jackson? I think it was a lawyer from Paul Hastings, the same guy the first said I've got a mental block on the name, who said that one of his partners was an ex-US attorney who had a case with me and wanted to know if I was interested in it. All right. I just don't remember. I just don't remember the name. And it was, it could have been, could he have called me in late January? I suppose he could have. I just don't remember. Do you know if that was before the screening of the documentary, Living with Michael Jackson? I have no idea. Do you know when, Living with Michael Jackson, was screened? No. Either in the United States or in England? No. Do you know, did you know the content of the documentary, Living with Michael Jackson? At what time? At the time that it was aired in the United States. Well, you'd have to tell me when it was aired and then I'd tell you. I guess you didn't see it, then, is that correct? Well, no, I saw it. But I didn't watch it when it was aired. I. All right. When you were contacted by somebody. Objection. Your Honor. He's cutting off the witness. Was your answer completed? All I was going to say is, I remember watching it for the first time when somebody sent it. I asked that they send me a copy of the videotape. I was aware of it before I watched it the first time because it was probably a subject of one of these conference calls. And, all right, now, when is the first time you spoke with your client, Mr. Jackson? Would have been probably that day at Neverland. There's no question that your client was Michael Jackson, is that right? My client was Michael Jackson. It was not Ronald Conitzer? No. It was not Dieter Weisner? Right. It was not Mark Schaffel? That's correct. Nor was it Vinny or Frank? Clearly it was not. And at all times you understood that you represented Michael Jackson alone? I did. You did not represent the Enterprise Neverland Valley Entertainment? I did not. Did not represent any of Michael Jackson's corporate interests? I did not. 
and you represented Michael Jackson for purposes of assuring that he avoided criminal liability and liability with regards to custody of his children, is that correct? That's correct. Your concern was that his children might be taken away from him? That was one of my concerns. Your concern was that he might be prosecuted for some criminal matter? I think initially my concern was, were the children and any allegation of the fitness of him as a parent, because that was a subject of a lot of the media firestorm surrounding him at that point. Was that because of his allegedly dangling his youngest child over a second-story balcony in a hotel in Germany? I think that that's what started some of that, but then the, there was, with the documentary, there was the same usual suspects hurling allegations at him about his fitness once the documentary came out. All right, but are we talking about simply neglect of his own children, or are we talking about his relationship with other children? Objection. Misstates the evidence. Lack of foundation. Leading. Overruled. I was concerned about his children and his maintaining his relationship with his children. But the issues that you were dealing with as a consequence of that documentary, living with Michael Jackson, had to do with how he interacted with his own children, correct? The issues dealt with the fact that there were people who were calling for DCFS to take the children out of the house. All right. And to conduct an investigation. That was what, that was what was the overriding concern initially. At some point in time, you had an opportunity to either read the transcript of that documentary, Living with Michael Jackson, or view it, is that correct? I viewed it. I didn't read the transcript. Did you view it before you arrived at Neverland? I couldn't tell you, as I sit here, whether I did it before or after. It was sometime within a very close period of time. At the time that you were at Neverland, you saw Ed Bradley there, is that right? That's right. Ed Bradley is somebody you recognized as being one of the commentators from 60 Minutes, is that right? That's right. You also saw an entire film crew from 60 Minutes? That's right. 60 Minutes you were familiar with. You had seen it in the past, is that right? That's right. You were a little concerned about Michael Jackson appearing on 60 Minutes, is that right? Yes. Had you had a conversation with Michael Jackson prior to your arrival at Neverland on that date? No. Do you know if that date was the 7th of February? I think I stated before that that date sticks in my mind. If that is a Saturday, that would be my guess. My best guess. I believe that when you executed the, or the officers executed the search warrant, they took some gate logs also. I don't know if the gate logs are accurate, but I later saw where I signed it on the day that I got there. Did you have a conversation with Mr. Jackson on the 7th? Yes. All right. Did you have a sense of the content of the documentary, Living with Michael Jackson? At that point, I was more concerned with what, the fact that he was going to sit down with 60 minutes and what the content of that was going to be. I spent most of my time talking with and trying to weasel out the information from the producers as to what was going to be the ground rules, which they said there were none. But the content, where they were headed, what they were trying to do, that was my concern. Did you ask any questions of Michael Jackson about whether he had been sleeping with boys during your conversation with him on the 7th of February at Neverland? No, I did. Objection. Leading. Lack of foundation. Overruled. No, I did not start questioning him about whether he was sleeping with boys when I was up there. Did you know, at the time that you were at Neverland on the 7th of February, assuming that is the date, that the issue of him sleeping with boys was, in fact, an issue that had been raised in this documentary? I think that I did know that. I don't know whether it was through the documentary or whether it was from the download of information. I think I probably had that information. Did you understand, at the time that you were at Neverland on the 7th of February, that Gavin Arvizo was one of the children it was believed that Mr. Jackson was sleeping with? I don't know that. When you say one of the children that he was sleeping with, I'm not clear on what you're, what you're implying there. I knew that Gavin Arvizo, when I was up there, was somebody who was reputed to be in the documentary. But I don't know that anybody said, hey, Michael Jackson is sleeping with Gavin Arvizo. I don't think that that happened. And I certainly, as I sit here today, I don't know if Gavin Arvizo says in the documentary, yeah, I was sleeping with Michael Jackson. I'll object as non-responsive as to what he knows today. The question dealt with on the 7th of February and move to strike. All right, I'll strike from, well, actually, I won't. He actually says as he sits here today, he can't remember what he knew then, 
so the objection is overruled. All right, but on the 7th of February of 2003, you were aware that one of the issues that you were dealing with, as his lawyer, was the issue of whether or not he had been sleeping with a succession of different boys over the last number of years. Objection. No foundation and misstates the evidence. I'll sustain the objection. Did you understand that Mr. Jackson, in the interview with Mr. Bashir, said, I slept with all of them, in reference to a number or succession of boys? On February. Objection. Foundation. Argumentative. Overruled. You may answer. On February 7th, I don't believe. I know you asked this. I just don't believe that I can tell you whether I had seen the documentary. I probably had not until after I got back from Neverland is my best guess. So, no, my guess is, as I sit here, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Did you have a conversation with Michael Jackson about Michael Jackson doing a press conference in Florida? No. Did you know that Michael Jackson had been scheduled to do a press conference in Florida? On what date? The 7th of February. On the 7th of February. No, I did not know that. Did you know that Michael Jackson had brought the Arvizo family to Florida to do a press conference? On February 7th, I did not know that. Did you know, on the 7th of February, that Janet Arvizo had never had a conversation with Michael Jackson other than a brief conversation back in the year 2000? Objection. Misstates the evidence. Foundation. Overruled. You may answer. Go ahead. On February 7th, I can't tell you what Janet Arvizo did with Michael Jackson. The only thing that I can tell you is I saw the Arvizos interacting with. My question was whether you knew about any conversations between. No. Objection. He cut off the witness again, Your Honor. It's non-responsive, I'll object. Move to admonish counsel not to cut off the witness. I'll strike after the sentence, the only thing that I can tell you. From there on, I'll strike that. Next question. Mr. Garrigus, did you have a conversation with any employee of Michael Jackson or representative of Michael Jackson directing them to have the Arvizos brought to Florida? No. Did you have a conversation with Michael Jackson or any representative of Michael Jackson directing that the Arvizos be brought from Florida to Neverland? No. Did you know that they were being brought from Florida to Neverland? On February 7th? No. Objection. That misstates the evidence. Foundation. They weren't being brought anywhere. I'm going to sustain the objection as vague. Were you aware that the Arvizo family was flown from Florida to Santa Barbara County and then driven to Neverland? On February 7th? Prior to, just prior to February 7th. I'm asking you, do you mean did I know that on February 7th? On February 7th did you know that? No. Did you make any inquiry as to what that family was doing there? Later. When later? Probably middle February. Two weeks later? A week later? No, by middle February would have been about a week later. On the 7th of February, did you recommend to your client, Mr. Jackson, that the family, the Arvizo family, be taken home immediately? No. A week later, did you tell Mr. Jackson that the Arvizo family should be taken home immediately? No. At any time during the month of February, did you tell Mr. Jackson that the Arvizo family should be taken home immediately? No, I did not. Did you have any conversation with Mr. Jackson at any time on the 7th of February about the Arvizo family being there on his property? To the extent that this, he's calling me daddy, or, Janet's encouraging him to call me, daddy, story was told to me. Did you talk with Mr. Jackson at any time on the 7th of February about the Arvizo family leaving Neverland? No. Did you talk with Mr. Jackson at any time on the 7th of February about whether or not Gavin was staying in his bedroom? No, not on the 7th. Did you know on the 7th of February that there was an issue dealing with boys staying in his bedroom? Objection. That had become quite public? Objection. Misstates the evidence. Argumentative overruled and foundation overruled you may answer go ahead do you want the question read back no i just don't know what you mean by an issue that it was in the public domain yes i knew it was in the public domain and did you discuss it with mr jackson no 
As his attorney and hopeful of avoiding any criminal liability on his behalf, did you tell Mr. Jackson on the 7th of February that he ought to refrain from having young boys come into his bedroom? No, I didn't give him, as I told you, any advice right then and there. I was, the first time I met him, I was trying to do an investigation. I was also trying to stop the 60 minutes interview, once I got a sense that it was not going to be a warm and fuzzy piece. All right, you've seen 60 minutes before, haven't you? If it's Morley Safer, you tend to get a different piece than if it's Ed Bradley or Mike Wallace. So even without knowing the issues, as soon as you saw it was Ed Bradley, you assumed it wouldn't be warm or fuzzy, right? I've watched Ed Bradley do some pieces that weren't exactly hard-hitting. Now, at any time within the next seven days after the 7th, the next week after the 7th, did you ever tell Mr. Jackson that he would be well served by keeping young boys out of his bedroom? I don't know that I talked directly to him that following week. The only conversations that I had for the next six weeks were usually over the phone and fairly brief. With Mr. Jackson? If he was on the phone, briefly. But they weren't extensive. All right. Do you know if you had any conversations with Mr. Jackson over the next seven days over the telephone? I couldn't tell you. I don't think so. Do you know if you had any conversations with Mr. Jackson over the next 14 days? Probably one. Just one conversation? Probably one. Can I assume that that conversation did address the issue of whether or not boys were still sleeping in his bedroom? Objection. Foundation. Argumentative. Overruled. You may answer. No, I don't think that the discussion revolved around whether boys sleep in his bedroom. Can I assume within the next 14 days after the 7th, in other words, up to the 21st of February, that you had by this point seen, personally viewed, the documentary, Living with Michael Jackson, the Martin Bashir documentary? Yes. And you had seen at that point Mr. Jackson's admission to sleeping with boys, is that right? Well, when you say, admission to sleeping with boys, what are you saying? The statement that boys will stay in his room? Yes. Okay, are you implying that's necessarily something sexual? I don't believe it's appropriate for me to be answering questions, Mr. Garrigus. Let's go back to the question again. I'm confused as to when you say, sleeping, boys sleeping in his room, I didn't, I didn't think, my concern was, Mr. Zonin. I'm going to object as non-responsive. I was trying to answer it. Cutting off the witness, your honor. Objection. Okay, everyone, we're going to have a time out. Next question? No, I want you to drop down about two degrees in. I ride horses, and we wait for the head to relax. Go ahead, relax a minute, all right. Thank you. Mr. Garrigus, when you watched that film, you did see the portion where Mr. Jackson refers to sleeping with boys, is that right? Mr. Zonin, as I sit here today, I don't remember seeing in that documentary, I'll take your word for it, that he said, sleeping with boys. The one thing that I drew from seeing Michael Jackson on February 7th and seeing the kids there was a gentleman who, to my mind, was almost childlike in his love for kids. I didn't see anything nefarious. I didn't see anything that struck me as potentially criminal. But I did see somebody who appeared to me to be ripe as a target. And so I took action that I thought was to protect him. I'm going to object as non-responsive. Sustained. Move to strike the last part of the answer. I'll strike after. I don't remember seeing in that documentary. Mr. Garrigus, do you recall the documentary where he said he slept with Macaulay Culkin? No, as I sit here, I don't remember him. I wasn't fixated on whether or not he slept with Macaulay Culkin. I really, that was not a concern of mine. Do you recall him saying he shared a bed with boys? I know that he has said that since then. I know. I've sat next to him, or in the same room when he said that, so I know that, that I know that he said that. Do you recall seeing the portion of the documentary where he's sitting next to Gavin Arvizo? That I have a vivid memory of. And in that portion of that documentary, he's holding Gavin Arvizo's hand? I have a vivid memory of that. And Gavin Arvizo is resting his head on Mr. Jackson's shoulder? Right. Gavin Arvizo shared a room with Mr. Jackson, is that correct? Aye, you're telling me. Objection. Argumentative. Overruled. You may answer. Do you want the question read back? No, if what you're telling is Gavin Arvizo spent the night in his room. 
Were you aware of that? I know that that's one of the things that's been claimed, yes. Did you ever ask Mr. Jackson if that was true, that Gavin Arvizo shared his bed or spent the night in his room? I think we discussed that. What did he tell you? That nothing happened. No, I didn't ask you that. What did he tell you about whether or not he shared his room or his bed? What he has consistently said the entire time that I represented him, which is that he didn't do anything, that there was nothing untoward, that there was nothing sexual, and that if somebody spends the night in his room, that that was just an act of unconditional love. That it wasn't anything that you're getting in here and... I'm going to move to strike as non-responsive. Objection. He cut off the witness. You did cut him off. Your question called for the answer he's giving, so... May he continue to give his answer, Your Honor? Yes, he may. The problem was, Mr. Zonin, as I saw it, when people say he's sleeping with somebody in his room, the jump is, with a lot of people, that that is something that is awful, that is something that is really, really bad because it must be sexual. Just a minute. You're lecturing the jury. Let's back up. I'll strike that. Do you want to go back to the question again? I'd like to ask a new one. Mr. Garrigus, did you ask Mr. Jackson specifically if Gavin Arvizo had ever spent the night in his room? Objection. Beyond the scope and foundation. Overruled. Yes, and he said nothing ever happened. Did he tell you that Gavin Arvizo had spent the night in his room? He said he may have spent the night in the room, like a lot of the other boys did, and nothing happened. Did he tell you how many nights Gavin Arvizo spent in his room while he was there? No, I didn't ask him. Did he tell you whether or not Gavin Arvizo specifically shared a bed with him? I didn't ask him about sharing a bed. I asked him in the room, I asked him if anything happened. His answer was, no, based on my observations. I'm going to object as non-responsive. Objection. He cut off the witness. Maybe we better resolve this, I think. Just a moment. The ruling is that, based on my observations, that will be stricken. Next question. Now, you never asked him at any time whether or not he shared a bed with Gavin Arvizo. I may have later on, after the arrest. I assumed we were still talking sometime in February. Yes. Of, 03. Yes. February of, 03, no. After the arrest, yes. All right. Now, during the next two weeks, did you have any other conversations with Michael Jackson about Gavin Arvizo? Other than the ones we've talked about, no. Probably not. Did you ever tell Michael Jackson that the Arvizo family should be taken home as soon as possible? In February of 03, no. Did you come to learn that the Arvizo family was spending a great deal of time at Neverland during the month of February? No, I came to learn that Janet Arvizo was making accusations about Dieter. I'll object as non-responsive. Sustained. Stricken. Mr. Garrigus. Did you come to learn that the Arvizo family was spending a great deal of time at Neverland during the month of February? Did I learn that in February? In February. Probably, yes. All right. Did you immediately call Mr. Jackson and tell him that the Arvizo family should be taken back to their home in East Los Angeles? No. I think I told him that in March, or told Ronald that in March, that they should, they should cut ties. All right. Now, at some point in time, you directed that your investigator have an interview with the Arvizo family? That's correct. And I think you said, do it yesterday, right? He said, when do you want it done? And I said, like yesterday. As quickly as he can possibly do it? That's correct. This is Brad Miller? Yes. Brad Miller has been your investigator for some number of years, is that correct? I think at that time Brad Miller I had used on three or four other cases. I've used him on a number since. Did you tell Brad Miller to tape record that interview? I believe I told him to tape record the interview, that I wanted a taped statement by the Arvizos. Did you tell him to turn off the tape recorder and not to record certain pieces of information? Absolutely not. Did you ever listen to that tape? Yes. All right. It is true, is it not, that when he asked the question about whether or not Gavin slept in the same bed with Michael Jackson, Gavin did not answer the question and Brad Miller then turned off the tape recorder. Objection. Misstates the evidence. No foundation. Overruled.
You may answer. I'm not so sure that that's what happened. What is your recollection of hearing that tape recording? It appears to me, in listening to that tape, that the tape was turned on, off, at least two or three times. And I can't tell you as I sit here what the question was before each one. But the tape is taped and is turned off and then turned on, so I'd agree with you as to that extent. Did you ask Brad Miller if he specifically turned off the tape recorder about the time that he asked the question of whether or not Gavin was sleeping with Michael Jackson? I, you bet I did. You're aware that other children have accused Michael Jackson of molesting them. You're aware of that? Yes. Objection. Foundation. Argumentative. Court ruling. Move to admonish counsel. Just a moment. The objection is overruled. The answer is, yes. All right. You're aware that back in 1993, there were, there was one lawsuit that was filed against Michael Jackson that was settled on behalf of a child named Jordan Chandler? Objection. Beyond the scope. Overruled. You may answer. Yes. All right. You're aware that there was another incident of a resolution of a claim against Michael Jackson involving a child by the name of Jason Francia? No. Not at, if you're talking February and March of, 03, no. You didn't learn that until some later time? Right. All right. But at the time that you were meeting with Mr. Jackson on the 7th, you were aware of the incident involving Jordy Chandler, is that correct? I knew. Objection. Asked and answered. Sustained. I don't believe the last time I said in February. I may stand corrected if I'm wrong. Well, that could be. I'll allow the question with that understanding. All right. Was that, in fact, something you knew about on the 7th of February? I think so, yes. All right. Did you ask Mr. Jackson about that allegation? Objection. Foundation. Beyond the scope. Overruled. No. Were you concerned when you saw Gavin Arvizo there, a child of the same age as Jordy Chandler? I don't know that I knew that Gavin Arvizo was the same age as Jordy Chandler. I suppose, obviously, at one point they were the same age, but I don't know that that was something that ever went through my mind. Were you concerned about the presence of this child at Neverland? Well, I was concerned about accusations that were being made, yes. Accusations by whom? The, at the time, in February of, 03, there was a swirl of publicity, and there were accusations that were being made by numerous people that his children should be taken out of the home. Just a moment. Let's take a break.